jump right in. Let's see. So we're going to talk, chat Xeriscape today. Um, if you guys have any questions, do not hesitate to ask them. We should have plenty of time to cover everything. Uh, but my name is Rodney. I'm the owner of Garden 17. Uh, Greg was going to join us today, but he is out today, unfortunately. So uh, we won't have Greg in with us today. Uh, but a couple of things that I had planned to hit on uh, are obviously to talk about what is Zurich or Xeriscape landscape, uh, top performing plants that we use often, the general benefits of a Xeriscape landscape, uh, and then basically how to design with Xeriscape, right? So kind of the, the, the key points to really pay attention to. Um, again, if you guys have any questions or if you guys have a specific piece that you guys are working on in your own projects, let's review it today. So let's jump right in. Uh, so Xeric or Xeriscape, you know, essentially what that means is a landscape that requires very little water and very little maintenance, right? The whole idea behind doing something Xeric is to keep it uh, basically natural, right? So you want to rely on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you want to rely on the natural amount of rainfall as much as possible, right? And using plants that do really well in our climate, right? So I put up here, it does not mean that it needs to be gravel or rocks, but it can include them. So in a couple of examples here, so we've got two mulch, uh, excuse me, two mulch beds and a gravel bed here. Uh, it does not have to be gravel. A lot of times when we think about something Xeric or Xeriscape, it, you know, we think cacti and gravel and very desert scape almost, right? Though that does fit the definition, uh, it does not need to be the definition. And so we've got a couple of different styles. This is a little bit more kind of leaning on that cottage style of landscape. This one is uh, very lush and green, as we can see. This is a local landscape here. Um, and then this one is also very green as far as the background is concerned. But they did use the gravel in the bed up front. A lot of times why we end up seeing the gravel used a lot in a Xeric landscape is because of the maintenance. It's not really a bed or a plan that requires a whole lot of maintenance to be maintained. And so typically we're not necessarily always worried about replenishing that mulch. It's also a heat thing, right? So we're typically using plants that enjoy our heat in our summers so the radiant heat from the gravel is actually beneficial to the plants and also keeps them a little bit warm in the the winter time it does not do as well of an insulation for roots and uh, root health though like a mulch does okay so it's kind of just a trade-off um, but definitely something to consider when designing um, another big thing that is kind of often a misconception is xeric does not mean no water it just means much much less water right just like any plant or any garden, we will need to water to get everything established, but it is definitely a lot less water after establishment kind of thing. Come on, there we go. Uh, so some top performers that we use often in our landscape, and I've got a lot of them kind of scattered here today, uh, but yuccas, agaves, cacti, of course, right? Low water, drought tolerant plants. Uh, Selvias, germanders, laurels, hawthorns, those are going to be great for our shrubs. That's going to be a laurel here and a germander and a hawthorn, right? These guys make some great shrubs so we can still get a lush look if that's the aesthetic we're going with. Silver pony's foot, um, we're really used to that guy. That's that little trailing silver one. And woolly stemodia is another fun one that's used a lot. Uh, it's just a good mass ground covering. Uh, and that's got a light purple flower. So unlike the silver pony foot, it does bloom, which is nice. Um, the Grow Green Guide that you guys have there in front of you guys, you guys are more than welcome to take that home with you today, but it's a really, really great guide that the city puts out. Uh, it has like everything you could possibly need to know about some of the plants. It is just a select few. It does change every few years, okay? So sometimes they will replace a plant or put something else in, um, but most of the time you're going to find a lot of plants that do really well here because they stay pretty strict to our natives and adapted plants in there. So naturally, they're going to fit into that Xeric category, right? Uh, Dominita and skull caps are also used quite often. These guys are going to be lower, more kind of shrub mounding ones. Um, but lantanas are really great. Right now, the Dallas Red is our plant of the month, so it's also on sale. Normally 19, I think currently 14. Um, but selvias we see used a lot. This is the selvia gray guy, right? Uh, with that bright red. This guy can also have whites and pinks that it comes in. Um, and this is a, what they call the misty or mystic spires. Uh, this is going to be a dark purple bloom spike. These guys can get pretty large though. They're going to be more five or six foot, so something to put more mid or back range. Whereas the Selvia gray guys are going to be a little bit shorter in that three foot range. So something that could definitely go towards the front. The yuccas we've got, so we've got red yuccas uh, here in the front. 
also a super common one that we use a lot. That's going to be the tall bloom spike with the bright red flowers at the end, right? Um, real easy to maintain, though. Doesn't really take much, right? You've got the color guard yuccas, which is kind of the yellow striped. Nice when you're using them in more of a cactus uh, or cacti garden setting, right, with the gravel, because that yellow just gives a little bit of pop. We're not used to a lot of foliage color out of our yuccas and agaves. Um, and then, of course, sotols. Uh, things of that nature do really well. These are the guys where you'll see a small trunk out of those, a little bit of a Dr. Seuss top on the plant itself, right? But these guys are all kind of your bulletproof. Um, drought tolerant, again, don't need a lot of maintenance. Self-maintaining plants are a plus for a xeric landscape, right? So something that you don't need to prune to shape or doesn't need to be cut down. Yes, sir? Uh, they do, yep, yeah. So agaves are going to be fantastic for that. And of course, there's so many varieties of agave, just like yucca. Uh, this one, I believe, is the artichoke. Yeah, we've got the artichoke one here. So this guy's going to be kind of a squattier, wider variety. What it's often grown for is the large uh, pad of its leaf, right? So that's one of those like extra wide ones as it matures. Um, the other nice thing about most of these, unlike the century plant, where it puts out a ton of pups, we call them, a bunch of small babies. So they kind of colonize a big area. The artichoke is used a lot in a landscape, a kind of a residential landscape, because it does not pup as much. You might get one or two throughout the year, but this guy can reach about three to four foot. So some of them actually spread pretty fast and some of them don't. You got it. You got it. So a lot more uh, contained. The big blue ones that we see used a lot because they're totally bulletproof kind of thing, those guys tend to pup very fast. They can shoot as many as a dozen pups a year, uh, pups being the baby plants, but that's why they end up in kind of small colonies like that. And they can look a little overpowering in a standard landscape for our residential homes because of just the sheer scale. So using in agave, uh, there's, uh, there's a wide range of what they call peri agaves, right? Um, so those guys do a lot better for scale wise, just their sheer size and maturity, but also the fact that they're not gonna pup like crazy, yeah. Uh, easy to propagate the pups though, um, but again, when we're looking towards xeriscape, we're typically looking for something low maintenance. So I do tend to avoid the century agave because of the pup situation. You're going to be doing that four or five times a year, you know. Yeah. So general benefits of a xeriscape. Um, basically, the biggest thing comes to less water, right? So we're going to conserve our water consumption. If we're using a, a landscape that is filled with natives, naturally you need less water, right? A native, by definition, is going to be used to our climate here. So it's going to be used to the heat. It's going to be used to our average uh, rainfall per year, right? So those are going to be ma massive things. Obviously, maintenance saves time, right? So if I need less maintenance into my landscape, it's also going to save me a lot of time. So huge benefit there. Obviously, those two things considered, you're also saving money at that point, right? Because if you're using less water, it's going to cost less. You're going to use less fertilizers by, by nature because, again, natives are used to what is in our soil. We're still going to talk a little bit about fertilizers today um, in the way of getting them prepped, but it's going to take a lot less in the long term or over, over a long period of time, right? And generally speaking, most of your xeric plants don't need a high ratio of fertilizers. Are you guys familiar with the three numbers? on the fertilizer, okay. I usually say keep it simple, leaves, blooms, roots, okay? So the first number is gonna feed your leaves, next number is gonna feed your blooms, and that third number is gonna feed your roots. So keep it pretty simple. I always tell everybody don't re relearn chemistry and all that, but that's the way to kind of look at it. And then when you get into fertilizers, there's gonna be two different types. So you're gonna have a liquid or what we call a granular, right? A granular is gonna be a much slower release because it's gotta break down into the soil before the plant can digest it, right? Whereas a liquid, a plant's gonna be able to digest it a lot faster. So when we do our initial installs of our plants, we always wanna use a granular because we want that to slowly break down over time into the soil to slowly feed our plant over time. A liquid is gonna be a nice maintenance one in the way of, hey, you're looking a little sad, let me get you a little boost for the season or the start of the season when you wanna get them going right away, right? So typically you start your liquids in about March time on average, um, you know, depending on the weather and the season, how cold it is, that kind of thing. Um, but that's typically a good benefit of a liquid is, again, it's faster acting over uh, a granular in that way. Now, thinking of our natives, they typically don't require a lot, right? So we don't need to do an overfeed unlike some adapted plants or non-native plants, uh, meaning they're gonna get a lot of their base nutrients from the soil itself. 
but our soil is a really heavy clay. Are you guys nearby in the Austin area kind of thing? Yeah, go. Cool. So our soils are just naturally a very heavy clay, right? So when we're digging, you take out big chunks and we have to really break down that clay. So composts will help you break that down as well as the granulars to jumpstart the plant to get it adapted, right? Both of these products are also gonna help create a little bit of a biodiversity in the way of breaking down that soil and getting all those microorganisms activated, right? So though our soil, or excuse me, our natives are used to our soil and know how to get nutrients out of our soil, we still wanna jumpstart that for the success, right? Um, we don't want to wait five years before they look their best kind of thing. We're already halfway through most of their life cycles, right? So we want to help jumpstart that. So when we do our, our uh, prepping, whether we're going to do a gravel bed or a mulch bed, your, so <coughs> excuse me, your soil base is still where you want to start. Compost is going to be some of your most important things uh, for, or most com important component for your creating your landscape, right? Again, our heavy clay soils also don't have a lot of oxygen. So we do want to use a compost that's going to help break down that clay, produce some oxygen into the soil, right, and get the roots fed really well. Where the fertilizers come into play is that long-term success, right? So it helps break down that soil, get the, roots, uh, get the roots fed, basically. And of course, our big one that we always hound on is less pollution, right? We're going to have less things like runoffs if we're not overusing our fertilizers going into the aquifers right, emissions from mowers and things of that nature, because when we get into Xeriscape on the next one, we'll talk design here, uh, we're gonna talk about the idea of less turf. So less grass areas, less turf areas. Is that a must? Not really, but to really fit the category of the definition of something Xeric is gonna be, again, less water consumption and our heaviest water consumer in our landscape is our lawn, right? So we're better off reducing our lawn to really fit that bill. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yep. So uh, turf alternatives are really are kind of the category we use to, to kind of label those guys. Uh, let me actually, well, you know what, though? This is a landscape of uh, Native Edge, our other company here. This photo is the uh, Woolly Stemodia. This guy is now, now this project several years old. This uh, Woolly Stemodia actually fills both sides of the walkway as if it was a lawn space, okay? So things like Woolly Stemodia, Silver Pony's Foot, Texas Sage, Sed, Texas Sedge, S-E-D-G-E, uh, is another really, really great one. That's going to be a grass-looking plant, uh, but it is going to be a longer grass, right? So it is going to be anywhere from about four to six inches in height most of the time, uh, or most of the year, I should say, but it does make that lawn effect. So things like uh, dogs still have kind of a green space to be in, right? I, well, least Amodia, uh, Silver Pony Foot is another one, yep. Do you have kiddos or dogs at home? No. no? Okay, cool. So uh, Silver Pony Foot probably takes the least amount of traffic, uh, similar to Woolly Stemodia. Uh, so if you have a heavy foot traffic area that you want this like lawn effect from, the sedge would be a better bet for those areas. Gotcha. Um, thyme is another one. So creeping thyme, like the herb, uh, is another really great one in our area because we stay relatively dry in that way. Um, and that's one that you could do by seed, so you can get quite a bit of coverage um, by, by s for, for cost, bang for the buck, right? Yep. Full sun, the sedge is going to be the only one that you can bounce back and forth with. So most of these other guys are going to want at least four to five hours worth of sun. Um, you have a relatively shady area. Very shady. Very shady, okay. Okay, cool. So probably the Berkeley sedge instead of the sec Texas sedge would be better for that. Um, that guy doesn't mind being a more of like a uh, understory, right? Um, it's a little bit, uh, what do I wanted to say, thicker blade, I guess. So it looks a little bit lusher than the Texas sedge does. But naturally, anything that uh, can handle more shade typically has a broader leaf, right? You got it. You got it. So yeah, Berk Berkeley Sedge would probably be a really good fit for your space. Um, frog fruit would be another really great one too. Frog fruit. Yep, uh, that would be another really great one as a turf alternative for the shade. Um, that one also has a little white flower too, so it gives you a little something throughout the year. Um, and honestly, it's gonna grow very similar to the woolly stemodia, except it's gonna be an all green instead of some of the gray. Uh, I don't think these photos, yeah, these guys don't have it. 
Well, also notice um, when we're when we're, we'll talk on design too on the next one. But we'll see typically in a zero landscape uh, more seating areas incorporated, right? And that's the idea is reduce those lawns and to have kind of these maybe gravel seating areas or just an open space of mulch, right? Um, it's just a way to kind of compensate the space that doesn't require maintenance, right? If we have just a mulched area really doesn't need much from us, right? Um, and if you've got your natives, they're typically spreading by seed and such anyways. So you're, you're naturally gonna create that, again, that biodiversity in, in the way of things seeding, spreading by root, et cetera. Come on now, there we go. So on this last slide here, realistically kind of walked us through the, the step by step of, of what we typically look at when we're designing. But basically, we want to make a plan, right? So we want to know our hot spots. We want to know where the shade is. We want to know where our drainage and things of that nature is because we want to work with these once we start into a xeric landscape. The goal here is to reduce as much friction into your current uh, property as possible, right? So what I mean by that is if you know where you've got a hot, hot area, maybe that's the area where we use uh, the cactus, the agave, uh, yuccas, things of that nature, right? Those ones that we know are tried and true with that hot, hot sun. And then as we're pulling away from those hot zones, typically along the curb, right? So we pull away from those or the middle of our yards, we can then get into something that's a little bit more lush. So this is actually uh, a sedge lawn alternative right here. So that's the sedge in this spacing. We did about an 18 inch spacing in this front yard. Um, you can do a little bit tighter if you want something a little bit more instant gratification, of course. Uh, this project is, gosh, six to eight years old now, I would say. Um, but our more recent photos of this, it just looks like long, uh, long, long lawn. <laughs> yeah, it just looks a little taller is all. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is basically completely dense at this point. Um, but yeah, so, so when we look at those areas, we want to know where our runoff is also because we want to work with that as best we can. So really a good r rule of thumb <clears throat> is any runoff on your property, you want to prevent it from going into the, the, the city's runoff, right? Into the storm drains and things of that nature. So we want to keep that on our property as best we can. So knowing where those runoffs are, we can create things like dry creeks and such that create a little bit more visual interest into our landscape. And again, they're taking up space that normally is just filled with turf, right? So knowing where those are is really important. We want to think about water conscious options. So again, less turf, placing plants um, along where we know our runoff, you know, wait, how can we keep all of our resources onto our property basically, right? Um, but thinking of water conscious options, if we don't have kids and dogs that need the lawn, that's where the sedge could come into play, right? If we don't need that perfectly maintained lawn, that's where we can utilize things like this. <coughs> Other water conscious decisions are excuse me, making mul multiple seating areas, right? This is a really small property that we did right over here in Midtown Commons. Um, and then this guy is in uh, the Brentwood neighborhood here. We expanded the outdoor living, right? Because we weren't dealing with dogs and things of that nature uh, that we needed to be conscious of. So what we did as an alternative is we've created in this particular design, we did a dry creek where we knew we had runoff that led us to a fountain. And then we had the sedge around the decking here to create that lawn aesthetic. <clears throat> but we then expanded the outdoor living spaces, right? And same concept here. To get rid of the lawn space, we expanded our outdoor living because we need something of interest. And if there's nothing to pull us into the landscape, then why would I go there, right? So by creating little seating areas or areas of interest, it now makes me want to come into the space and we get full use out of our yards, right? Uh, prepping soil, we just talked about that with the compost, right? Uh, healthy deep roots uh, are extremely important for drought tolerant plants. So the better prepped the soil, the more successful you will be. Um, we often use the saying, put the $1 plant in the $10 hole, not the $10 plant in the $1 hole. Meaning, spend your money on soil, right? Soil is not inexpensive and that's where it's great to start with things like one gallons because you're also gonna have a longer term success. This plant is much younger and can it do its full establishment in your landscape, right? Whereas when you buy larger plants like five gallons or 15 gallons that are fully grown at times, you're buying a plant that has matured elsewhere that you're needing to acclimate into your space, right? So these guys are much younger, uh, so a lot easier to establish to your space. Also, think about digging this hole compared to a 15 gallon hole. I like that idea a lot more, right? Uh, so it's a little bit less work for you as well. But compost is going to be key there. We want to we want to release as much of the nutrients that is locked up in our our clay soils as possible. 
uh, we want to think creative. So when we're working in small spaces, uh, how can we kind of optimize those spaces? Uh, I used this photo specifically for that line there, but you'll notice we created angles out of the space to elongate the space. It also just creates added interest. There's so many different ways to do that when we're looking at design. We've also created raised planters here that focus us into the front door so we know clearly where the front entry of the home is. That was a big complaint of that customer there. But these are all design tricks that we can do to still utilize the idea of a high-end design with native very low maintenance plants, right? So it doesn't have to look like, uh, it doesn't have to look wild, right, to be Zurich. It can still have uh, design elements that create that aesthetic for us. Now, that is nothing wrong, though, with a nice wild landscape, a bunch of wildflowers, right? So we can still have both. <laughs> um, when we're looking at this, too, we want to think about things like color, texture, height, scale, and focal. So like I was just mentioning, we created our focal by uh, lining our planters on either side to look straight at our front door here, right? Uh, we're creating focal there. When we're thinking about texture and scale, I've got low grasses here, the sharpness of the yucca, and I'm getting that interesting height out of those bloom spikes, right, in that setting. So we're looking at these different ideas of scale and how they pair with the space to get the most impact. Uh, typically, Xeric design is pretty minimal, right? It can be very low maintenance. Um, I'm going to jump back real quick to this other slide, this guy here. Realistically, this is pretty minimal, right? We are just focused. I've got a focal point down here. This red color is bringing me in. The walkway is well designed and laid out for me to navigate. And this, again, is a variety of sedge. This is the taller variety, though, so you'll see that these guys are a lot larger. I'm sorry, that's not. That's deer muley. That's not a sedge. That's deer muley. So those guys are probably two to three foot tall in this photo. But again, it softens that curve too, right? So we're getting some really great texture and visual out of the space. Same thing here. I am curious where this path brings me, right? It brings us into the space. And so we think about those different focal elements, right? So when we're designing our space, again, it doesn't need to be plain Jane. It doesn't need to be just rocks and agave when we're looking at our space. We can have something that is a little bit more lush with texture and color uh, and still uh, accomplish those Xeric principles, right? Come on. There we go. Um, you'll notice, too, with Xeric, they tend to, like I said, they always tend to lean towards the gravels, the hardscapes, the metals, things of that nature. Um, to be honest, there's not really a reason why other than it just fits the bill. Right? There's not a necessity, though, out of the design. We can still get a lush landscape that is Xeric in nature, right? Because we can pair that with our natives, just like the one we had with a bunch of the flowers, a little bit denser in planting. They're still native plants. It's still low maintenance. Uh, you know, it doesn't really require a lot of resource to get that created, right? So talking about natives and products, let's hit on a couple of these products right quick so that we're kind of all on the same page. When you are using native plants, you're naturally going to attract your native species of bugs, pollinators, moths, bees, those kinds of guys. This product is super awesome for any bug issue. This is called Bee Safe. It is an oil, so it is something that you still want to use super early in the morning or late in the evening. Early morning is always best for applications when you're doing a hose on sprayer like this guy you just took in the hose and spray. But this guy is literally named Bee Safe because it's safe for the bees. So it's going to help us with our aphids, and um, it's also a fungicide, so any fungal issues, you know, your common pests in the landscape. But when you're using natives, you want to be extra sensitive to the ecosystem around us, right? So Bee Safe is going to be really, really great for that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the granulars. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the blooming products. So our natives can still go through rough points of the year. Uh, we can get hot quick, right? So uh, like let's think about last year. When it got to 100, it just decided to stay to 100 until it wasn't anymore, and then it snowed, right? Uh, but <laughs> when we got to that 100, a lot of our natives kind of panicked a little bit, right? So when we got to that, uh, what was that, the first weekend in May, if I remember correctly, even end of April possibly, it kind of stayed there. And so what happened is a lot of our plants freaked out, and they lost their blooms because of snow. 
stress. So we do want to still have handy uh, products that can help our plants bloom that are still organic. So you'll notice this guy's a 383. Um, Fox Farm makes the Tiger, Blo or Tiger Bloom here called 284, right? So you've got a couple of options in that way. Microlife's a great one out of Houston. That's the same granulars that we're looking at here. Um, but these guys are going to help bloom uh, for our natives. So if they need a little boost, these guys are going to both be great options to do. Now, typically when I'm going to get into my xeric plants, I know they do not want wet feet, meaning they want good drainage. So not only is the compost important, uh, where I am is not too far from here. So I like to mix in the lava sand or even a green sand, to be honest. It's going to give a little bit of texture to the soil as well and help water flow a little more freely. Both of these guys are packed full of some awesome supplements just naturally. Um, and so you're feeding that root system along with the compost, helping break that down. Um, in our application, not much, honestly. You know, for what we would be using it for, for our perennial beds, for our xeric, they're, yep, they're adding the drainage and nutrients, and so you're, you're good on either one. Green sand's got a little bit more benefit for like a lawn space when you use that application, but we're talking about less lawn, so we're gonna ignore that detail. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's really the only difference. Um, they will retain a little bit of moisture too, uh, not in a bad way though. So mo moisture retention can go two ways, right? Too much moisture retention and we can worry about things like root rot and sitting soils because again, we're digging into our clay soil. We want to break that down in combination with your composts though. It's going to be the right balance. These guys are going to help break down the soil, move the water, get some oxygen in, and then this guy's going to help you retain a little bit of moisture so that that root system still has something to drink out of the soil, right? So good balance in combination. We talked about the 624. Another favorite of mine here, though, is the what they call the bioinoculate by Microlife. Uh, but basically, this is just all the good stuff into one. It's more of like a vitamin, though, for a plant. So this, think about this one more as a supplement versus a food. So a fertilizer is going to be something with a registered amount of numbers that we can read on it, right? A measurable amount of those nutrients. Whereas a supplement is, think of it more as like a vitamin C right or a multivitamin kind of concept you can always use a supplement and a fertilizer together so you can always use two of those guys in combination you never want to use two fertilizers or two supplements even though they are organic that's where you can cause a little bit of burn right you don't want to overdo it basically uh, but yeah granular upon planting and then keeping your liquids handy for that long-term maintenance that's the easy easy way to do it keep keep it simple right um, what questions do you guys have? You guys working on any particular projects that I can help with? Doing? Okay. 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 Pick it. Yep. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that can hold that. Yep. So the sedge is great for that naturally because it's also got a very fibrous root system just like any grass does. So for erosion control is really good. Another great one for that space would be basket grass. Um, yep, and that's going to be very similar to that deer muley we were looking at on screen. Deer muley honestly would even do okay if you got a little more light. Um, but that deer muley is probably going to want somewhere in that four to five hours of sun range. So if you're not quite getting that, I would stick with things like the basket grass and yeah. Cool. So yeah, so I would go Berkeley Sedge. The basket grass would be another really great one. Um, and you can even work with that little channel that the water's starting to create, right? So you can, you can kind of utilize that as something of interest in the space, right? Um, where you could almost double as a walkway even, right? So you could use a gravel or something, right, that you could also walk on to navigate the space if you need it. Um, if you created a really defined um, channel, kind of like a dry creek bed almost, um, I would definitely suggest some sort of walkway instead of, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it gives you, gives you a little connection. Step stones or something even work well, right? Um, yeah, you could definitely play with both routes. Um, side yards are some of our favorites to design at Native Edge because they are such underutilized spaces that can become these great little magical space uh, with very little effort, right? Um, this, this design here is actually technically a side yard. You can see the sidewalk in the, the street here. So we, we did a lot with a really small space. Um, but yeah, they're often underutilized areas for sure. 
this one here, that's just a pea gravel. Um, pea gravel is really nice for your kind of open areas or negative spaces in that way because it's visually very soft. Um, and if it's not an area that you plan on walking on a whole lot, it is a much softer gravel. So it never really truly compacts. Um, things like a decomposed granite, which is the same kind of gravel we have out here, hike and bike trail, right? It's very jagged. And so the more you walk on it, the more you compress it, the more it kind of interlocks and it becomes a little bit more like concrete, right? That's what I Yeah, okay. So what is wonderful on one side of decomposed granite, but terrible for that, is it is chocked full of a bunch of great nutrients. So decomposed granite is a great soil amendment. Yeah. Um, but the downfall is when you do a large space, if you're not walking on it super frequent, right, it's, you know, you're not running on it every day kind of concept, right, it is really great for those volunteers to show up. Yeah. Um, what kind, is it like in a large bed space? Is that how it was used? Yeah. Um, a, is, it, is it densely planted or is it? Um, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything. Oh, okay, okay. It was around, I built it around a, 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 a raised garden bed. Yeah, okay, so great. Like, yeah, the little walkways and stuff. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Uh, For sure. So a great product to use might be the horticultural grade vinegar. So our vinegar that we keep in the kitchen is like eight to 9%. Uh, horticultural grade is usually 18 to about 20% vinegar. Um, if you're sensitive to vinegar, definitely use some gloves, um, but you would literally just put it in a little spray bottle and squirt. The problem is this is non-selective. So on a windy day, you don't want any of that to catch because you will still burn spots on your plants, uh, especially if it's like your raised veggie beds, they're pretty sensitive, right? So just keep it low when you're squirting, um, but use that one because you want to cause damage to the weed, right, in the hottest part of the day. So middle of the afternoon when the sun's full blaring, use that horticultural vinegar and you'll see some burn on the plant within a couple of hours, typically. Uh, oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now, it isn't organic, though, because it's just vinegar, right? So it will, uh, its half-life is very quick, basically. So it's going to break down in the soil very fast. So usually you're going to, especially if you're already kind of dealing with a challenge, you're going to have to do like a weekly treatment. Typically, it's not the exact same weed, at least, right? You're kind of bouncing around, but it will take some time to build that up right? Um, but yeah, if you do like a weekly spray, make it part of your Saturday morning routine or something, you know? Um, but yeah, the hotter the day, the better for that to work the most active. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we usually sell it in like a one gallon jug similar to this. Um, it should be in the apothecary. But yeah, that would be a great one to just keep them at bay. And it's super organic. So using it around your raised beds is, is totally fine and safe. Yeah. Yeah. Decomos granite's a double edged sword. <laughs> uh, Sure, uh, sure, sure. It's not as compact as I would like it to be. Okay. Uh, I wish there was like some kind of supplement you could like, spray on there, like, like to make it like harder. harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is technically a glue that you can use. Um, super toxic stuff, though. Um, that will leach into the soil. So the only concern I'd have is that it's around your raised beds and yeah. such. Um, the other thing that you might, I'm just kind of thinking about this, is your raised beds are, you're watering those much more frequent than anything else. So that water is probably also keeping the decomposed granite a little bit moist underneath. And so that could be some of the challenge. Um, you can rent a machine compactor. Yeah. It's just a plate compactor, right? Um, we do, I think we still have a couple in stock right now. They're like hand tampers. So it's just a plate with a pole on it, right? And you can, you kind of just drop it and go. Sometimes that's really, really helpful because it's, it's a little bit more of a surface area that you're compacting at the same time. So it helps that interlocking effect. Um, and the more it is compacted, the less anything can grow in it too. So you, it could do you double duty in the way of helping keep the weeds down too. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of neat though, because in a way, um, we have some Mexican uh, feather grass. And they love it. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 No, it can be a little difficult. Um, yeah, Mexican feather grass is another super great one if you've got some sun um, as a great xeric plant because just like that, it's not like you're watering it, it just exists, right? Um, yeah, that's always the goal for sure. 
Um, cool. Yeah, uh, P gravel we've used in the past. Um, we so this gravel here is a P gravel, and then this is the uh, what they call the Black Star or the Tejas Black, right in the back. That's going to look literally like loose asphalt, right? It's kind of that black chunky. Um, great for walkways because like decomposed granite, it compacts, um, but it is still again a sharp gravel. So if you're a barefoot, I'm going to walk out in the yard barefoot kind of person. Not the most friendly thing to walk on, you know. Uh, P gravel is usually better for that. Like the crushed limestone, or yeah, it's like a uh, limestone, screen. screen, yeah. So that's actually the exact same thing, but instead of black being white. So that's really the only difference. It's still super sharp. It's jagged like that. Like I mean, if you've got decomposed granite, it's if you walk that barefoot, it's going to feel the exact same. Um, the benefit. Of, a, of the white versus the black is, you know, most people will say, of course, one's going to be hotter than the other because of how light works. It's still gravel. It's still hot in the summer. It's Texas. You know what I mean? So it's not really, it's not really taking away a lot of heat. Yeah. Um, not a measurable amount, at least, I would say, in, a, in a, your residential scale kind of concept, right? Um, the, again, the benefit of something that's jagged is it is going to pack. Uh, whereas a pea gravel is just naturally softer. So it just, you know what I mean? You kind of, you kind of decide what you need in your space for those reasons. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so mulch we do typically top dress, right? So typically, um, I would use the reason gravel was used here and here is because it is a space that was de designed to be walked on, trampled through, and be very utility, right? But you'll notice that it's accompanied with mulched beds for the plant material. I typically, if I'm going to have a densely planted area, I'm going to use mulch. Mulch is so much better for the plant health in the long term. Also, I can fertilize a lot easier. So if I am dropping a granular two or three years in, I'm using my liquids and stuff, I can also take that mulch and till it into the soil and put new mulch on top without any extra effort. And it's actually good to let that break down into the soil. It's going to create that chunky, again, get oxygen back to the soil. Because if you think when you do your compost and you prep your bed, you've got all this oxygen in there, and then we slow water and that soil just ch -ch -ch in compacts right and you get rid of the oxygen just naturally and so after a couple of years you want to get that oxygen back in there for health right so that's where the mulching is nice because you can break that back down um, in a space like this the sedge is so tough it doesn't need it. it's kind of like the the Mexican feather grass just popping up in the decomposed granite so I'm less worried about it in a space like that um, this bed here, this photo really doesn't do it justice. This has pea gravel, but that actually has mulch on it. Um, it's kind of difficult to see, but that is actually, this raised section here is a mulch. Um, so it just, you know, it's, it depends on what you're doing. H mulch is the healthier option, though, for your plants, right? Um, I'm going to typically use a, a gravel in a, where I want a little bit of negative space or where I know I'm going to traverse between plants in the landscape, right? Okay, that another question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Got that slope. Yeah. Prepping the soil. So what's happening right now is a lot of your soils, you know, again, we're very clay soil. Once it's packed, the water's going to run off of it just like it's going to do the cement surface, right? There, it, it takes so much uh, slow trickle to actually penetrate into our heavy clay, right? That's not the type of rain that we get around here, right? So it often just runs off the surface. Once you have prepped that soil, the compost and things of that nature, that soil is breathing at that point, right? Meaning we've got a bunch of holes and air pockets and such. So as the water is hitting the surface, it can actually penetrate into the surface now. So once you've prepped it and you've put some plants, even if you do a little dry creek, you'll notice a lot less water naturally running off than previously. You do got, yeah, it's, that's that's the work. Now, if you if you can funnel it, like kind of depending on how your space is, is laid out, if you can get it all into a kind of a dry creek, if you can get it to a central point and create that kind of dry creek effect, um, the gravel is heavy enough that typically it's not going to move. So uh, let me see if I've got. I don't know if I've got any pictures of any. Yeah, yeah I don't think I do. Yeah. Yeah. So those. 
Right. Those outcroppings I would use to your advantage too. So kind of have that dry creek kind of snake around those, right, in that way. And then you could plant around those little outcroppings with the sedge and such because that's where they're naturally going to grow in the hill country anyways because that's where a lot of the soil settles on top of an outcropping, but that's where all the nutrients are, right? So that's where plants typically hang out. So it would look very natural in that way. So yeah, you could definitely pull that off for sure. Um, is it coming off of like the roof or is it literally just surface runoff kind of thing? Just surf or runoff, so. Okay. So at the top, what you might do is kind of at your widest point to try to capture if you're creating that dry creek. If you know, if you go that route, right, you kind of create a little bit wider and let it funnel down and then you can kind of snake it through the space. You want to go path of least resistance though. So you know where the water's going right now, right? You kind of have, so I would kind of work with that the best you can because it's going to be the path it wants to continue to use. But yeah, at the top, you kind of create a, a funnel effect, right? So kind of capture as much as you can. And then you can come and make it a lot thinner because now you've already got it captured into that space. And anything that does come outside of your dry creek, if you've got your plantings, and you don't have to plant the whole thing, right? You could, cr you could literally do pockets of plantings. Um, so you could do... I think what I would do is actually create a slight depression into the surface. So, yep. Yep, that's usually p more than enough, right? Because that soil, you're not actually fully prepping there as far as compost and such goes. So you've got basically a concrete basin you just created, in theory. You know what I mean? So yeah, if you just create a little bit of that depression, you can then use things like um, a lot of the stone yards. Um, Whittlesey is a company that we use that's just, what is their north location is at like the um, the toll road in I-35, right, where they come together just south of that intersection, basically. Um, they have a, uh, some limestone mixes that are kind of rubbly mixes, but they're great for dry creeks because they look most natural and they're super inexpensive. Um, so you could pick it up, have it delivered kind of thing. That's a great thing with them. Um, but yeah, th that's kind of the way you could run that one pretty easy. Um, and then what I would do is, you know, your larger ones on the side, smaller ones in the middle kind of concept, and then just grab a few bags of pea gravel and kind of top dress in there to, to fill it in. And now you've got a natural variation of size. And then where these outcroppings are that you've already mentioned you kind of have going, that's where you could do some of the sedge and basket grass and kind of do it in pockets so that you're not needing to plant the entirety of the space um, to let it kind of fill out and, s and seed out on its own over time. Uh, Turk's cap would be another really great one. Turk's cap, that's in, that should be in the Grow Green Guide as well. Um, super easy, low maintenance native, uh, fits that Zurich. So even a shade bed can be drought tolerant, right? You know, where it's not needing a lot of water. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, I think that was all my slides, guys. That was, that was a pretty easy, fast one. You guys have anything, any other questions we can get into? Yeah, I think that was it on mine. There you go. Deal. Deal. I need something to do, right? Um, yeah, and if you guys, if you want to take pictures of your space, bring them in. You know what I mean? We can, we can go through, like, the, the photos of everything together. Um, any, any of the sales folks on the floor love photos to work from because, you know, when you, when you say, hey, it's this big, uh, you know, it's always relative, right? Um, you know what I mean? So it's, you know, so if you're like, it's this big, but if we kind of have a photo that we might notice like, oh, hey, your neighbor has a gutter here. Actually, a lot of your water might be coming from that or what have you, right? Or a, a downspout, right? Um, so, you know, sometimes photos are nice just because we can be like, oop, I noticed something that maybe you didn't even realize was a factor kind of thing, right? Um, but yeah, photos are really great to work from. So if you want to snap a few photos, come on in. We can doodle together and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll find the solutions. <laughs> uh, and then, like I said, I think the vinegar in the apothecary, try that and then tamper on your DG and you'll probably knock out the weeds pretty quick, yeah. Appreciate yeah, thank you guys very much. I appreciate you. Uh, like I said, spot, awesome. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys made it. Um, the Grow Green Guide, too, is really great at telling you kind of heights and widths and stuff. So when you're kind of planning your spaces, uh, even like in your little outcropping, right, low to the front, high to the back kind of concept. So it looks and feels a little bit more natural. You get that layered and textured effect. Um, start small, go to big in the backdrop, right? Uh, but yeah, keep, keep those little factors in mind. But the Grow Green Guide does really well at kind of telling you, hey, it wants sun, it doesn't want sun. Um, it's two foot, it's 10 foot, that kind of concept. They do really well at breaking them out between different uh, types of plants, like trees, shrubs, uh, perennials, that kind of thing. 
If you've never had one, you will start referencing it a whole, whole lot. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great guide. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate your guys' time. Um, we are, like I said, the Dallas Red Lantana right now. So if you guys are jumping into some sunspots, uh, is the plan of the month. So it is marked down, I think, to 13 or $14 instead of the normal 19 kind of thing. So we'll do a little highlight usually once a month. So that's going to be the plan of the month for June. Uh, next weekend is our spring market, too. If you guys have never been to, or excuse me, summer market. Uh, if you guys have never been to a market, totally worth coming. We've got about 20 to 25 vendors that are all like local makers and such. They put up their tents out front, usually all plant related accessories. So we've got a few like local ceramists and, uh, you know, propagation creators and things of that nature, right? Um, that's next weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, 10 to 4, both days on that. Um, during the market too, we don't have a normally scheduled class, but we have a uh, like a tie-dye activity going on. So uh, feel free to stop in for that, make a little shirt while you're here kind of thing. Uh, and then classes do resume the following weekend, which I believe is Father's Day weekend. Um, so we're doing like a succulent potting and stuff like that for that. Um, and then we've got one more class after that as well. Is that 10 to? Uh, 10 to four. 10 to four. Yep. Vendors are usually all set up at, at 10, um, and then they run until about four each day. Yeah. yeah, and if you've never, and we do like, so if you guys are here that weekend too, just so you know, there's uh, activity stuff going on. We do a little prize wheel and stuff too. So like uh, if you make a purchase that weekend, you go over, you spread the prize wheel. It's usually things like uh, f fertilizer, you know what I mean? Like little smaller fertilizer samples and stuff like that. So pretty good stuff that our vendors send to us to give out as freebies so people can test their products. Yeah, we, ju we just make it a game. <laughs> Cool guys, well I greatly appreciate your time. So what was your name? I'm sorry, I didn't even ask earlier. Brad. Brad, awesome Brad. Marco. Marco, awesome. Nice to meet you guys both. Um, like I said, let us know if you have any questions. Um, bring in some photos for your space too. Your Rodney. Rodney. Rodney? Yep, Rodney. You got it. Yeah, you guys as well. I appreciate you guys coming today. Um, yeah, like I said, bring photos of your spaces too. Photos are great for us. So.